we're back for draft season, which means we're going to be having these shows weekly again up to the NFL draft. We'll take it step by step from there. But that means you're going to get rookie evaluations from Derek every single week. There's going to be a profile on the site. Uh, we're going to have an episode of this. They're going to be a little more tailored than they were before. Previously, we talked through two to three quarterbacks an episode. These ones are going to be a little bit more dialed in on a single prospect. Um, and today we're going to be starting off with USC star Caleb Williams. But let's hop right into it, man. Caleb Williams, USC star. I mean, during the season, it was it was tank for Caleb Williams. We're, we're finally past the season now, which means we're, we're ready. And I'm excited to pick your brain on this one. He's kind of a... Um, polarizing prospect a little bit i think the word generational gets thrown around a lot we'll we'll kind of discuss that near the end of the show a little bit but give me some quick thoughts what are you seeing from caleb williams out of usc yeah i mean i'll start off off the top with kind of the, the generational hype i think the generational stuff is unfair basically all of the time um like all the comparisons to Mahomes and stuff is ridiculous like best prospects since luck like it's just a lot of undue pressure for a guy at the same time he's a guy you take first overall and you don't even really think about it um and that's not necessarily to even say that he's better than drake may or whatever i think you can go one two either way there um but he is the caliber of, of prospect that you pick first overall every time like i think he's just a, a phenomenal player and we'll dive into a little bit um of the numbers here in a second but i just think between some of the tools that he has some of the creativity he has and I think there's a little more like nuance and detail to his game than people think. And again, we'll dive into that in a little bit, but I think people kind of put him into this bin of like, he's like Zach Wilson coming out of college, or he's like the insane Patrick Mahomes where all he does is the crazy stuff. And if you really watch him and, and like dig deeper into his film, he does have that, but it's not really as pronounced as people think. And I think there's like more, um, you know, meat and potatoes to his game that I think people give him credit for. I was curious to where we were going to end up on that because I, after watching, and I'm I'm not all the way through the film, I, I don't think I'm as far along as you are, so I can't really talk about it. I haven't made my way to Jaden Daniels yet. Um, I'm just finishing through J.J. McCarthy. But I, I kind of came to a similar conclusion where it's like, I, I still very much see why Caleb Williams is the one. And it's not because he's a perfect prospect by any means. Like, he's he's probably not close to as polished as luck was coming out of college and even there's like an argument between where Trevor Lawrence was, but watching him play, I feel like he has, I feel like when you're looking for a quarterback prospect to be a, like a franchise changing player, you're looking for something that makes him unique, something that makes him different. It's like, what, what does he do? And it's like, he just kind of has that little bit of like an it factor to where like, yes, he's making these hero balls, but the, the best way I could put it was he almost plays football like I see Luka Doncic play basketball, where he's moving at his own speed sometimes, where it's like everybody else can be moving around him really fast, the game can be moving really fast, and he kind of just is on his own timetable. And I think that's a really unique trait for a quarterback to possess to where if it works out, I think he has the highest ceiling of anybody in this draft because that's such a special, unique trait to be able to, to, be able to like walk into a game and move at whatever pace you want to move at. I think it's maybe his most special trait, in my opinion. I, I think that's a phenomenal point, because if you look at it, it's um, it's kind of like quarterbacks like that dictate how the rest of the game goes, like how the game is played to them rather than like the defense is dictating to them how the game is played. Like you look at Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, all of the guys at the top of the league, they dictate the pace and like style at which the game is played. And I think that's a great point about Caleb is that even for some of his flaws and some of the things that he's going to have to fix in the NFL, blah, blah, blah. He does have that quality to him where it's like, he is kind of the chess master behind the, how the game is going to play out. Sometimes it's going to work. Sometimes it's not, but like he is very clearly the one who is dictating what is going on. So I think that's, that's a really cool point about Caleb. That's, that's what I saw, but I would love to see you break into the numbers a little bit because that's what we do. That's what the charting is there for, not just the not just the full eye test, but I mean, I hate when people say that because charting really is kind of the eye it test. It is an eye test. <laughs> <laughs> like everybody's like, oh, we're like, you're just staring at data all day. And I'm like, well, no, like that's- I that's am the film. film. <laughs> As for Caleb's numbers, he, he's actually kind of an interesting, uh, 
he kind of has has an interesting profile in the sense of like if you just look at his adjusted accuracy which i think every time somebody looks at a profile is going to be the first thing that they look at it's not that special like he had a 70.4 percent adjusted accuracy um which is about one percent less than bryce young a year ago it's like five or six percent less than cj stroud was a year ago and it's only like one one and a half percent better than like will levis and anthony richardson last year who were still both quality prospects but like part of the knocks on their game was that they were not all that accurate so for 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 caleb to like kind of be in that range of like not clearly an elite prospect just purely based on the adjusted accuracy thing i think is probably going to spook people a little bit but you dive into like the entirety of his charting profile just in terms of like where he's throwing the ball and like what routes he's throwing the ball um all that sort of stuff it's actually pretty clean across the board like we have the the success rate um map pulled up here it, it, you know if you're watching the clip the only area he really struggles is the 11 to 20 middle of the field and here's the thing guys he's like six foot of course this is where he's bad look at kyler murray look at baker mayfield like um a, a lot of these guys uh, russell wilson a lot of these guys who are like sub six two six one that's just naturally going to be an area of the field they struggle with a little bit more because it's a little bit harder to see sometimes it's a little bit tougher to throw over bodies compared to a guy who is six four and has a high release you know what i mean like that guy a Drake May, for example, is going to be able to get his arm over a defensive tackle pretty cleanly. Whereas for Caleb, that can be a little bit tougher and it can be a little bit harder for him to get to the spots that he wants to. So that's kind of why he struggles a little bit in that range. But like anecdotally, when I watch him on film, I think he actually makes enough of those throws pretty well that like he can be in the Kyler Murray bucket where Kyler Murray coming out of Oklahoma, not good in the intermediate like middle of the field range it, it, because he was short. Like he just didn't have, he was, didn't have the ability to layer the football, all that sort of stuff. As we've gotten three, four years into Kyler's career, that's not an issue anymore. It's like, it's still not his best area of the field, but he can throw that well enough that like you can piece together the rest of the offense. And so I think when you say that about Caleb and then you look at some of his success elsewhere, like he's good outside the numbers in the intermediate area. He's really good down the field. He's actually pretty good in quick game. Like, he was pretty good at just about every area. So for him to only have that blemish, not a huge deal to me. It's more important to me that he's at least average or above in every other area. And then on the route chart, the only thing other than checkdowns that he was below average on, which that one is kind of like, I don't really care that much because USC just like didn't really believe in those in their offense. Um, the only other one was corner routes. And he went, I think like six of 11 or, or, or something like that, or five of 11, I think maybe, uh, in my charting the thing is like that's one kind of a small sample relative to to having charted like over 400 passes like only 11 corner routes it it's kind of such a small sample that one or two passes can really sway how big you know like where you end up in the bad to average to, to good range the other thing is just like when i watch him anecdotally i don't feel like it's a problem like i've seen him make some really sick throws on corner routes because i know that he has the arm talent i know he has the quick release i know that he has the ability to like put air under the ball i know he can make that throw so even though it doesn't come up well on the route chart i've seen enough that i'm like this is not going to be a problem in the nfl and then so like i said you look at the rest of his route chart and it's either average or above average in every other area like he can throw everything so just purely picking off of like the where he's throwing the ball stuff for his data I have basically no qualms like we knew he was going to struggle a little bit over the middle because he's short but other than that he's he's pretty clean and i think that's really important when i was looking at this too I, it brought it brought up something that i've you know we've seen cliff kingsbury offense in uh texas tech and arizona and there's there's a lot to be made about everybody always talks about like oh cliff couldn't succeed under Patrick Mahomes, yes, I was not a big fan of what he did at Texas Tech as well. I had, I was even less of a fan of what he did with the Cardinals. But a big a big part of his offense is really just not a lot of creativity over the middle as well, which I feel like really doesn't play into when you're looking at Caleb Williams. Where you're like, yeah, he's struggling over the middle of the field. His height is a big factor in that as well as the offense they're running just doesn't... There's not a lot of creativity. This is not a... 
like Shanahan style offense. This is not a like Dolphins style offense. They're not running those like crosses across the middle, creating a lot of space for like easy layups. A lot of it's outside work. Like you said, there's no check down game in Kingsbury's offense at USC. Like it's it's not tailored to make life easy for him across the middle of the field as it is more on the boundaries for the offense they were running at USC. I didn't really see anything that had doubts. Like you said, he has the arm talent to make that that throw into the corner. Like the corner is red here. And people I feel like people would be a little worried about that because of like the high amount of cover two that's in the NFL, where you see a lot of like if you're gonna make that throw, it has to be dropped in, air underneath it in the corner. And you're saying like he could still do that. Like that's not like there is no real question of arm talent when you're looking at Caleb Williams. Yeah, that's the thing is that even for some of the areas he's not perfect in, I look at the way that his like just the elasticity in his arm, the velocity he, that he can get, the layering he can do with the ball on top of like he's a pretty confident passer. And I don't think he's like scared to throw any area of the field. You look at that and it's like, yeah, he's probably going to be able to figure this out in, in a year or two. So I, I don't really have any issues with like where he's throwing the ball and that other starter stuff. The other thing about Caleb's accuracy, he's really, really good at at putting the ball where it needs to be, which sounds like a very simple way to put it. Um, but he's really good at throwing into tight windows. He had a 47% accuracy into tight windows, which at least compared to the NFL sample I pulled last year is, is pretty damn good. It's, it's up in the above average range. Pretty much anything over 45% you're cooking, and then anything over about 50 is like elite. So he's not quite in that elite tier, but he's definitely in that in that very good tier, um, which I think is really important. And you watch him in some of his best throws or he's just pinning it on a dude into a, into a doorknob. Like it's just it, the way that he's able to do that is really impressive. Um, and then like kind of coupling with that, only 6% of Caleb Williams' passes were like outright defended. Um, some of that is because they kind of cheese a little bit of stuff in the underneath area where like it never has a chance to be defended. Um, but only 6% is, is a pretty good number for someone who is like generally perceived as this like chaotic, making mistakes, throwing into traffic all the time. Like he doesn't actually do it all that much. And yet he still has the ability to put the ball where he needs to in tight windows. So I think he actually does a better job of like walking that line than, like I said, than people give him credit for. Talk to me a little bit about his RPO rates. Um, so far, the highest in the class that you've done, he's at a 20 point, like a little over 20% RPO rate, uh, which with how many that you charted during it, that's almost a hundred attempts under RPO. He was incredibly good on it. There was no like real flaw in the game. He like it, it was great. He had a success rate at almost eighty nine percent, which is like far above average. That's a really good rate when you're running RPO. Um, does that kind of play into what you're saying? Like where some of these passes are a little cheesed under to where it's like there's really not a lot of times you could see RPO where you're kind of bootlegging out. There's a really nice underneath pass. Talk to me a little bit. That seemed like a, a lot of high. I wasn't expecting that high of a number. I think looking at the RPO rate. Yeah, that's where they're cheesing the offense. They USC specifically runs this little RPO where they have uh, somebody run out into the flat, like somebody cutting across the formation. Um, it's like kind of a flat route, kind of a, a screen. Uh, but like you said, it, it never gets defended because it's basically just zone read with, with that attached to it. Um, and it works, and it works really well for them. But like the reason I actually think the RPO stuff and it being such a high rate doesn't actually bother me is, to me, there's basically two different kinds of RPOs. There's the basically what this is where it's like a flat route a screen route it's more of an extension of the run game than anything like it's kind of just almost like the modern triple option um where you're not really throwing the ball and then there's the downfield rpos the stuff that like um lane kiffin absolutely loves to do um or alabama did for a while where you're hitting those glance routes drift routes over the middle of the field like 10 to 15 yards down the field those to me are two very different things if you have a quarterback who is doing a lot with like the downfield RPOs, kind of like some of the Alabama quarterbacks that have come out, um, you know, Tua Tagovailoa, uh, Mac Jones, guys that were in that offense. That is a little more concerning because they're kind of cheesing throws that are like more valuable, which is not going to be as common in the NFL. Whereas like to me, the stuff that they're doing at USC where they're just like cheesing him these easy throws into the flat, 
that to me is like the offense just not wanting to directly run the ball. And that to me doesn't really mean anything about the quarterback because they're not even asking him to do anything, right? It's just like kind of free yards or whatever. It's not like actually cheesy. Yeah, exactly. Like (laughs) they're not cheesing the stuff that should be hard. Like they're just giving him easy throws that are that would be runs anyway. Like, so that to me, it doesn't really make me all that worried. Like when those, when the 20% rate of RPOs drops in the NFL and it inevitably will, cause nobody does that in the NFL. I'm not worried that it's going to like hurt Williams's ability to play the position or anything. Well, let's talk a little bit about the tape. We have a couple clips here to go through. Um, which one, which one do you want? Do you want to start with this one we have down here? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with the, the one we have against, uh, I think it was Nevada earlier in the season. Um, So this to to me me about why you pulled this one. Yeah. This to me is like the quintessential 2023 USC Caleb Williams clip. Uh, What you're going to get here is is Nevada is going to end up playing like a two high coverage. It's going to work out kind of like quarters. And because this, I don't know if he's a nickel or if he's a a backer, but either way, he's playing inside leverage of, of this slot receiver to the left side, which is kind of going to tell you that he wants to be in the run fit and he's not going to be immediately matching the number two. Okay, if that's the case against quarters, against his too high coverage, that means the safety is going to be playing over this slot player. Um, and the slot player is going to end up running kind of like a speed out to like six, eight yards, all that sort of stuff. Okay, well, if you're getting a slot player running a speed out against a safety that's trying to cover from 10 yards away, should be a pretty free throw, right? Uh, you would think, but sometimes that's just not how Caleb's brain works. So Caleb's going to take the snap. He's going to look at it. Safety's driving down, trying to play it from 10 the same way that I just said was going to happen. And Caleb, just for whatever reason, does not feel like throwing it. He does that sometimes. He just, there are a couple times a game where he's just like, the easy throw, I don't want it. I don't care. And so Caleb is actually going to come backside. But then this is where you kind of get the USC element and problem of this. As you come backside, nothing is happening in in this route concept. Like, I'll even um, pull it back again. They have three people to this side. They have uh, a wide receiver and a tight split, the tight end and the running back. The running back is kind of just running like a swing. The tight end starts to run like a little hitch route and then runs a seam route that doesn't really make sense spacing wise. And then the receiver is like kind of running a curl route that comes back into a dig route that is just getting in the way of the seam route that the tight end, like the spacing on all of it makes basically zero sense to me. And it feels more like freestyle than anything. So obviously when Caleb comes back to it, he just doesn't feel comfortable with any of it because it's a nonsense concept. And then he just runs around for about five seconds, ends up finding somebody in the end zone anyway. Like that to me is quintessential Caleb Williams USC where it's like, okay, he's skipping skipping by the structure at the first part of the play. Second part of the play, he's trying to do a different part of the structure, but the structure sucks. And so he has to break the play and then the play is broken and he throws a touchdown. Like that to me is Caleb Williams in a nutshell. Yeah. Cause you can see even at the halfway through that, where your far left receiver after his route breaks down, he still drops the defender in the end zone and you've got him breaking across the middle of the field. And you're still, like you said, like his eyes have moved from that left side of the field. He's on the right side. There's nothing happening in the play. And then you get a highlight play. It's like, it's a question of like, yes, he's, he's not really, he should have made that first read. In the NFL, you're going to want him to make that first read right away. If he doesn't make that first read in the NFL, you're you're going to get, you probably hit, you know, you're probably getting clocked. You can get outside the pocket like that, but it's not going to break down really the same way that it will in college. Um, is that is that a worry you have with him at all? Honestly, no, because I, I think there are actually plenty of instances, and I'll actually have a, a, a clip later where like he actually does handle playing in structure pretty well at certain points and at certain times, and I think he has the capacity to do it. I think just like three times a game, he's just like, ah, I don't want to. No, thank you. Which like because he makes it work so often, I think it's probably kind of fine. It. Yeah, I kind of respect it, and like I think he'll probably be fine. But I really don't think it's a matter of like he doesn't know what he's seeing. I think it's just a matter of like, I need to go make a play, which he's physically, he's, he's making the decision to, yes, yes. to switch off. Of it's that. a conscious, yeah, it's a conscious thing. And to, to back it up a little bit, which this play is in the 20. So this counts as a, as a red zone play. 
uh, when you're charting. And that was one of the other things that really stood out to me on his profile is he had almost a 74% 74 red zone success rate, um, which you're converting in the red zone three-fourths of the time. Not converting, I'm sorry. That's the wrong way to say that. Um, But passes completely in the red zone, he had a success rate of almost 75%, which means three-fourths of his passes in the red zone are accurate. And that's, that's like kind of a testament to like, where the disconnect is where people are like he's making these hero ball throws these errant throws that aren't like you usually see hero ball in the red zone like that's where people really go and he is throwing really accurate passes in the red zone he's making good decisions if they're not there he's sometimes throwing it away but most of the time he's making just really good accurate passes in the red zone and that's that's what you want like if you're gonna have someone dial in at any point in the field it should be 20 to goal line like that's when you want someone really dialed in i feel like his film speaks to that all the time constantly who constantly in the red zone i feel like he's dialed in he's making those good passes and like just just pro passes when he's there and and that doesn't even account for the rushing he does obviously i don't I, i don't like chart any of the rushing stuff but um he's a really useful running threat inside the red zone um you can use him on design stuff he's obviously a fantastic scrambler there was I think the Arizona State game this year was not his best throwing the ball for large stretches of the game, but anytime they needed him in the red zone with his legs, he he came through. And like that's kind of a testament to his game that like even when he's not at his best as a thrower, he still has this other thing in his bag that he can just go to, which is it's that's, that's what you want. Yeah, that's when when you made the Kyler Murray comparison of like uh which which you talk about if you haven't read his article on the site go read it he does talk a little bit about some of the comparisons to pro players um i saw a lot of that there when when you're in the 10 the five yard line uh the scrambling like the end zone the red zone presence of Caleb williams as a runner i saw that a lot in the comparisons of what you saw out of oklahoma with kyler what you see with kyler in arizona to where it's like if he isn't running on the drive at all uh once you're in the five to ten yard line like he will score like he he will take that so i saw a lot of the comparisons there i thought it was a really good take um, but we have some more clips here. What do, what do you got up next for me? Yeah, so I, I actually have two clips in, in a row that I'll go um, I'll go with here. And I think this is kind of just the best way to get a picture of, of Caleb Williams and how he processes. One is going to be good. One is going to be not good. Um, I, I think generally he is actually a good processor. I do want to say that before I run the clip. I think he actually does he, – he does a lot more in the down-to-down – like outside of the highlights and lowlights that make him to me look like a fairly polished quarterback. At least I think more than people are giving him credit for. Um, at the same time, he can be a little bit late sometimes. And I think that is a, is part of why he can struggle over the intermediate area of the field is that sometimes he gets a little bit too hung up on wanting to make an initial throw, especially if it's down the field and that can run him into some issues. So um, what you're going to get on this clip is, they have two receivers to the right side, one split out way to the left side. The isolated receiver on the back side here is going to end up running a dig route. So theoretically, when Caleb comes off of whatever the front side concept is, which is like a post wheel thing, he can come back to this dig and against, um, and he can throw this route. The thing is, Caleb needs to be on time and he needs to be able to like get his eyes back as soon as that receiver is breaking and he can throw it immediately. Caleb sometimes, as he does on this clip, he kind of takes a beat too long here. I'll pause it at the top of his drop here. Caleb should know like now whether he wants to throw whatever is happening front side or whether he wants to come come back to the to the other side of the field. He kind of takes a little bit too long here, takes an extra beat, I think, at the top of that drop that he doesn't need to take in order to come back. And then by the time he comes back to this dig route, he kind of already runs himself into the hook defender. I think if Caleb is able to kind of earlier in this play, almost at the top of his drop, recognize that he wants to come back and throw it immediately and anticipate it. I think he can make that throw. I've seen him make that throw. He just doesn't in this instance. And I think there are certain times where where that's the case. So I think Caleb generally gets what to do. Like he got there eventually, right? Sometimes it just needs to be a little bit faster. Yeah, he, when I was watching through his games, I, I didn't really have a lot of, worry about him being able to make it through his reads um he has 
sometimes you'll see a quarterback kind of lock on to their first read, especially in college a lot. Um, I've seen mo- like there was a lot of evidence of him being able to move off. Like if his first guy was covered, he is not afraid to go look for that like that deep ball too. Like if he's like, oh, my first read's not there. I feel like he immediately checks 40 yards down the field first. Like I feel like he looks and he's like, can I throw a touchdown then right away? And he's like, okay, that's not there. Moves on to his next read. Um, I, I saw him working through his pro, uh, proje- Ooh, sorry, progressions pretty quickly. And I think that's your next clip as well, too, if you want to pull that over. Yeah, I'm get that um, ready. Talk to me a little bit through through this part. Yeah, so this one, this is actually where I think Caleb does some of his best work. Is um, So USC is actually going to be sending a blitz on, on this play call. And before I even get into what they're doing, USC has trips to the left side. They're pinned on their own y- one yard line, by the way, for people who are just listening on the podcast, they're pinned on their own one yard line trips to the left side, uh, a receiver in a tight split to the right side. Basically they're going to run a little two man, like quick game concept to the right. It's going to be, I, I think it's a snag concept where the isolated receiver is running like a little hitch. The running back is going to swing out of the backfield. You're kind of trying to manipulate the flat player. Um, and then to the left side, one of the receivers on the left side, on that trip side, is going to be running back to the middle of the field. So kind of the idea is that Caleb can, if he wants to, open to this little snag side to the right, come back to the left, and throw this route coming back into his vision. Caleb is actually going to do a really good job of identifying that one of these two linebackers that UCLA has up to the formation is going to blitz, which is going to force the other linebacker to kind of go over and play this little snag route from the isolated receiver. And as soon as Caleb sees this one linebacker fire and this other one have to move over to, to go take care of that snag route because the corner is going to fall off for the flat linebacker needs to go play the hook and, and play the snag route. Caleb is instantly going to reset, come back and throw that route coming back over to the middle of the field. So that to me is a really good job of Caleb understanding how the play is supposed to progress like on the chalkboard or whatever. And then also him seeing post snap, Oh, they're blitzing. This is going to open up the middle of the field because of the way the linebacker has to go cover this and making a play. So that, that to me is like where you see really impressive moments from Caleb. Like he's not just this go do crazy stuff guy. Like he has moments like this that are in structure and look good. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I think we'll, I think we'll see a lot more of that too in the NFL to where like it'll shine a little bit more if you can get him into a system where it's like it's a li- hopefully i mean who knows because now kill if kingsbury is with the commanders but like hopefully he's out in a little bit more creative system to where if you're playing within the structure of an offense that is already laced with creativity it puts a little less reliance on that of your quarterback to where i i don't personally think cliff's system this last year for USC was necessarily the most creative offense we've ever seen. Um, but I think in a system to where you have something already laced with creativity, I think that's where he can thrive because not only is he able to go through those progressions, make those like system throws that you can read the defense, run the offense really well, but he also has that second level of creativity on his own. That's where I really see him thriving the most in the NFL. Um, speaking to that, as we kind of wrap this up, where do you want to see him go? If you could, if you could really dream scenario, let's not, let's not go insane here and be like, yeah, yeah, he gets drafted by the Chiefs and sits behind Mahomes for ten years. Like, where would you want him to go if you could, if you could manifest him to a specific team? Where would you, where'd you be sending him? Because I, I have my answer in mind. Um, I think I probably have it down to two teams, but I, I kind of want to hear where you think he would. Let's, where do you think his career would flourish the best? I mean, in in terms of like semi realistic ones, I think it's it's tough. Um, I think Chicago is actually not that bad if they, if they can figure out the wide receiver core a little bit. So I actually think he might look out. Um, in in that sense, I think if I could like try to prognosticate some team doing something insane. And, and like a place that would be really cool. I think Miami, like if, if there's a world where they don't want to pay Tua and they just want to like go all out and it's, I, I it's, this is like a literally 0.1% chance of happening, a but pipe dream. Yeah. Complete pipe dream. But like, I just think that would be such a cool, uh, combination of, of talents. The fit there. I mean, yeah, you want to give, you want to give a quarterback an offense that's already kind of structured, 
Um, which is my main worry with him with Chicago is is not necessarily that like in the he shouldn't be the pick there. It's just more of like are they set up to continue his career really well? Um, the way you see with like the the Sam Donalds of the past, where it's like, do you have a chance with that Jets team? Uh, I think the Bears are much better like staffed for that. They have DJ Moore, they have Colt Komet, they have players, but they, they do need to be adding talent if they're going to support someone like um, Caleb Williams and really have him flourish. My pipe dream, which is going to sound homery because it's so unfair, but like for me, it'd be the Vikings. I would love to see him team, but with Kevin O'Connell, I think that offense is very creative. You already have like a, a dead set cast in Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison. Um, he even, reunited with Addison. Pretty, pretty cool. Reunited little. with Addison. Yeah. yeah. Um, that to me feels like the, the, the kind of pipe dream. Cause they're sitting at like 11, but it's like, if maybe, maybe the Vikings don't trade though. So that's <laughs> never going to happen. Um, but that, that to me was like, I would love to see him in an offense that's already loaded. Uh, which is why I think my second place is probably with the commanders. I think, teaming up with like Terry McLaurin, Jahan Dotson, having like a defense, decent offensive structure. Their defense is horrendous. So they need to make a lot of picks there, but somewhere where he has a little bit more weapons to choose from, I think would be a lot of fun. Um, and obviously I think that's why they brought in Cliff Kingsbury, but who knows if that actually amounts to anything. I think they're going to be trying. I think that's why they yeah, hired him. You're right. Trying. Um, invading him in okay so boy, as we wrap this up uh, i have a couple of sh- quick questions for you if you could summate his game into one word what would be your your descriptor of caleb williams probably explosive i i just think everything that he does is good or bad it is explosive and and something is going to happen he's very much in the josh allen paradigm of quarterbacking i love that if you could give me, well, I think I know the answer to this, but one pro comparison. People love the pro comparisons. I think it's irresponsible, but let's give me, give me one good pro comparison. Mine is still Kyler because I'm never going to compare anyone to Mahomes. I think that is completely insane. Um, so I think he's a little bit more like Kyler. Maybe a smidge more creative, but that, that's where I'm going. I love that. I think you see a lot of that too when you're watching them play more than people think because he's just taller. But um, that's great. If if there was if there was one thing that you think could hold him back, because it's always an option. There is always like that. What would be your your pinpoint there? Um, not being able to to speed himself up over the middle of the field. Um, this is something we you know Bears fans are going to have uh, trauma with with Justin Fields. That was kind of always his issue. Um, but that was kind of the question with Kyler Murray coming out of college. It was a little bit the the, the question you were going to have with Baker Mayfield coming out of college, Bryce Young coming out of college. Like sometimes these guys who are just not tall are going to struggle to see the middle of the field, and some guys can can speed it up, and some guys can't. So um, if he fails, I, I think it'll be because of that. I love it. Well, thank you. Uh, awesome show. Thanks everybody for listening. We're going to wrap this one up. Uh, if you haven't already, check this out on YouTube. We are going to be doing film breakdowns on this one. They are a little more visual friendly. Obviously, we love that everybody listens to the podcast, but go check out the YouTube channel. We'll be posting these. Derek will be posting clips of them on his Twitter. Uh, and stay tuned. Articles are going to be coming out every week on these guys up to the NFL draft. We're going to be doing one of these breakdowns every week up to the NFL draft. So make sure you like, subscribe, and until then, we'll see you guys next time.